In fiscal year 2019-2020, Sierca wrapped up its efforts to promote inclusive and sustainable agricultural and rural development, or ISARD, with particular focus on social inclusion and environmental sustainability. The center pursued its mandate through its three core programs. The Research and Development Program led the promotion of ISARD through evidence-based investigations and action researches. Some projects aim to help ASEAN farmers adjust to market changes and penetrate new ones. Other research projects intended to help accelerate equitable growth and provide inputs to policy. The outputs, lessons, and recommendations of two action research projects were published in guidebooks that can be used to scale up to other countries. Researches were also conducted under Circa's own collaborative research platforms. The findings of fancy projects conducted by members of the Circa-initiated university consortium were disseminated in an integrated forum on food and nutrition security for Southeast Asia. Collaborative researches in nine Southeast Asian countries were also supported by Circa managed grants facilities. Circa also offered its own support programs that complemented its R&D initiatives. As one of its main mandates is to produce leading champions of the SARD, the center has awarded more than 1,800 graduate scholarships. Circa stepped up its efforts to contribute to internationalization of higher education through the MSFSCC, which it developed with two European research organizations and 14 Asian and European universities. Circa continued to support young and strategic universities under its IDA program. In addition to its staple face-to-face -face learning events, the Center launched the Circa Online Learning and Virtual Engagement, or SOLVE, as a platform for webinars. Circa landed new development projects along its strategic thrusts valued at $1.2 million. Circa's strong track record has earned for it good standing with both new and long-time partners to work in areas where they can make a significant impact. The center entered into joint scholarships and worked closely with various university consortia and development networks. Circa also widened its engagements with Asian and ASEAN organizations. Moreover, Circa conducted a number of conferences, workshops, and policy roundtables. Circa provided access to its collective knowledge through publications, websites and social media channels, and its knowledge and information centers. In carrying out its work, Circa prides itself with its core group of experts backed up by excellent support staff, consultants, and senior fellows. The center maintained its strong financial position by generating new funds, combined with judicious management of resources. The center is now poised to implement its 11th five-year plan with a strategic thrust of accelerating transformation through agricultural innovation or ATTAIN. With the support of partner institutions, Circa can confidently make the strides it has achieved so far even better, bigger, and smarter.
ました。สวัสดีน้องซื้อน้อยเป็นสาวพัสิกรอยู่บ้านหอยเมืองคูนแข่งเสียงขวงเปิดตั้งแต่มีข่าวพญาตระบาดเนาะปัสสุนเขาเจ้ากายานบุกก้าออกออกเงินไปซื้อเครื่องซื้อของเนี่ยพักเฮากระบได้ขายเพราะว่าไม่ค่าอยู่ตลาดเขาเจ้าบมาตลาดบมาขายเครื่องเลยตลาดเขาเจ้าบริปิดแต่ว่าไม่ค่าอยู่ในตลาดเขาเจ้าปิดห้านเองปกติหันเขาเจ้าซื้อไปตางแข่งก็คือไปหลวงพระบางหันมือมือละหกเที่ยวแล้วก็ไปปักสันหันอาทิตย์หนึ่งสามสามเที่ยวแล้วก็เขาสูงเวียงเนี่ยสูงเวียงหันแล้วแต่สูงตามออเดอร์เขาเจ้าสั่งเขาก็จึงสูงแล้วก็มีไม่ค่าสูงอยู่ตลาดภายในสิงขวางนี้มีอ่ะมือหนึ่งมีมีประมาณหกหกเจ็ดคันเดี๋ยวนี้บูมีเลยมือหนึ่งออกบฮอดร้อยมื่นบฮอดต้นสัราคากระตุกราคามือหนึ่งหกหกพันกีบกับบูมีไผ่มาซื้อสลายมีแต่สาบ้านแถวใกล้ๆนี่เขามาซื้อไปเกลือใกล้ตะกี้เราวันบุญีคุณตะกี้มันมื่นสามสิบสามสิบพันหาสามสิบห้าช่วงแพงสุดก็มื่นหกสิบยูเฮือนเลี้ยงงัวก็เอาไปเกลืองัวเกลือใกล้สองร้านโดยอันนึงก็แม่นให้รัฐเสนอให้รัฐบาลมาซื้อพักน้ำซับสวนเนาะแล้วก็ไปแจกยาให้กับประชาชนที่กระเจ้าอยู่บ้านกระเจ้าบกาออกจากบ้านเลยเพราะว่าพักเขากับราคาบุได้แพงพออันได้ขายพอได้ต้นทืนคืนกันอย่างดีนะอันที่สองก็เสนอให้รัฐบาลเนาะช่วยสร้างอ่าสางเย็นที่ว่าเขาสามารถเก็บพักได้หลายแล้วก็เก็บไว้ได้ดุนเพื่อว่าเขาจะเก็บไว้ในยามที่มันบริขายแต่ว่าโตไปถ้าเขาผลิตบริเขาก็มีพักทำขายอยู่ก็อยากให้เพื่อนช่วยเรื่องภูมิอมมุมให้สาส่วนเขาหู้จากการไปหู้พักเนาะก็คือพักเอาไปเฮ็ดพักแห้งอบแห้งคือมักเลนก็เอาไปไปหู้เป็นซอสมักเลนเพราะว่าทุกมือนี่เขายังซื้อเครื่องของจากประเทศเพื่อนบ้านการกินอาหารที่ดีที่สุดในประเทศเราและการกินอาหารที่ดีที่สุดในประเทศเราและการกินอาหารที่ดีที่สุดในประเทศเราและการกินอาหารที่ดีที่สุดในประเทศเราและ
Welcome to Asia Dra e-learning exchanges on rural development and transitions or alert. The webinar series aims to keep the network's members, partners, and other stakeholders abreast of important rural development issues and emerging trends during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. In this second episode, the webinar would focus on how family farmers, especially young farmers, are coping during this pandemic. This second episode is co-hosted with ASEAN Farmers Association for Suitable Rural Development, or AFA, Pambansang Kilusan ng Mga Samahang Magsasaka, Pakisama, and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO. We hope that through this discussion, we will be able to contribute in increased understanding of and awareness on the opportunities and challenges confronting rural community family farmers, especially young farmers and their organizations during this pandemic. We hope that this discourse will contribute to deepening the agenda on UN Decade of Family Farming and UN Principles on Responsible Agricultural Investment. Joining us here today, is Mr. Jumer Markaida, young farmer leader from AFA Pakisama. Pakisama is the National Federation of Farmers Organization in the Philippines and is a member of AFA, which is an Asian-wide network of farmers federation. We also have Dr. Glenn Gregorio, director of Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture. Circa, and research, uh, CIRCA is a regional center mandated to strengthen institutional capacities in agriculture and rural development in Southeast Asia through graduate education, short-term training, research, and knowledge exchange. Also with us is Mr. Michael Riggs, team leader for Responsible Agriculture Investment of FAO. From the private sector, we have Mr. Reginald Lee, Director for Partnerships Grow Asia. Grow Asia is a multi-stakeholder partnership among farmers, government, and private sector, NGOs, and other stakeholders in Southeast Asia aimed at lifting the productivity, profitability, and environmental sustainability of smallholder agriculture in the region. Before we proceed, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our uh, participants. We have close to 120 participants from different countries in Asia and Europe. Welcome to this webinar. We also acknowledge our audience watching on various Facebook live streams. To start our discussion, uh, let us first watch a compilation of stories of different farmer organizations in the region during this pandemic. The video is courtesy of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, or AFA. Hi, a warm welcome to everyone. We hope you are all in good health and in good disposition amidst the current pandemic. AFA is a forest and farm producer organization or FFPO of family farmers at regional level currently with 20 member organizations in 16 countries with around 13 million small-scale women and men producers engaged in crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, herding, and pastoralism. We collaborate with regional CSOs and FFPOs reaching around 30 million family farmers in 12 other countries. Talking about crisis, we face a lot of risks. Foremost are risks associated with the climate and weather. And now we have the COVID-19 pandemic. In Asia Pacific, many of us were harvesting our produce when COVID-19 came. But we cannot bring our products to the market and the traders and buyers could not get to our farms. Offices, hotels, and restaurants were closed, so there were no demand for food supply in these otherwise ready markets. We were forced to sell low, dump our produce, or donate to more needy families. In the cities, however, food was scarce and more expensive and less accessible. No markets, 
no buyers, no processing facilities, no storage facilities, meant no incomes for family farmers when we should be earning during harvest time to keep us afloat until the next harvest season and to have some capital for the planting season. In the face of multiple risks, we have no choice but to be resilient, pliant as the bamboo, so to speak. And in every crisis lies an opportunity, so our efforts to manage risks are directed to build back better. Let me share with you some stories on resiliency and building back better. During COVID-19 times, FFPOs showed their resilience and solidarity work. AFFM Myanmar distributed food packs to about 40 families who were locked down because a farmer there had a virus. It also started a farmer direct selling to affiliated trade unions. Sawa from India made 5 lakhs of face masks and distributed these free to farming families. In Nepal, women farmers enhanced their kitchen gardens. LFN Group from Lao partnered with local government, a logistics company, and traders to bring their products to the market. What I would like to highlight to you again now is an inspiring story. The all-women cooperative of indigenous community of Numaga Tremontados named Kagat, organized by partner NTFP-EP. The women belong to two FFPOs affiliated with Pakisama and are struggling against a mega dam construction that will flood their ancestral lands. The FFPOs have received rice, noodles, and canned goods as COVID-19 relief. The farmers had a bumper harvest, but nowhere to sell or local traders were buying cheap. With Pakisama facilitating market linkage, Kagat partnered with the Homeowners Association to use its covered basketball court for a weekend farmer's market. For four weeks in a row now, they have been selling about 40 varieties of fresh and affordable fruits, vegetables, and root crops, including their non-timber forest product, brooms and broomsticks. It also partnered with De La Salle Brothers, who bought 600 food packs consisting of assorted vegetables to cook favorite local nutritious dishes of pakbet, sinigang, and laing. Kagat also gave 100 packs to their members who are most vulnerable, those who lost income from the community tourism business due to the lockdown. It also partnered with two online vegetable delivery shops catering to middle class families in Metro Manila. What has been the result so far? They were able to help at least 100 of their members to increase by 25% on average the price of their products lower by at least 5% the retail price of vegetables, root crops, and fruits sold to the consumers, and contribute to supplying more nutritious food packs to urban poor families. Its capital increased from $250 to $1,600, with net income of $1,340 in a month-long operation. Most importantly, they felt that they were able to expand their contacts and broaden their partners with different sectors and increase solidarity among their own members and with consumers. They face many challenges as a startup cooperative but would like to face them head on. Primarily, this pandemic made citizens realize again the value of farmers producing local healthy food and governments the value of becoming more and more self-reliant in agri-production. It confirmed our advocacy for shorter and inclusive value and food chains with strong participation of farmers in the governance of these chains and confirmed our belief that it is with solidarity and cooperation that we can prevent another food and nutrition security crisis. As we discuss the new normal, and build back better post-COVID and still with climate change, we are proposing the empowerment of family farmers through our organizations and cooperatives in the work of producing healthy, nutritious foods in shorter food chains and in more inclusive value chains with strong participation of family farmers in the governance of these chains. Let us take this opportunity to call on our governments and development partners to provide sufficient direct financing to FFPOs to upscale our endeavors in raising awareness on COVID-19 and climate change in our communities, 
acting as local government partners in distribution of emergency food assistance, especially through public procurement, ensuring rights to access and control over natural resources, lands, waters, forests, breeds, seeds, increasing agriculture productivity through agroecological and climate resilient approaches in farms, fisheries and forests, as well as ensuring supply of seeds and other production inputs, processing and distribution of food through post-harvest transportation, logistics facilities, as well as access to finance, and strengthening the capacities in policy and program engagement with local government units and in sharing of experiences to learn from good practices and to capture lessons learned from all these endeavors through an integrated approach of organizing, federating, and capacity building of women, men, and young family farmers through their FFPOs and cooperatives and in partnership with key stakeholders such as government, CSOs, and development partners. We firmly believe that when family farmers are regarded as frontliners and their FFPOs are seen as key actors in crisis and risk and disaster management, we unleash the potentials of millions of small-scale family farmers to implement the action plans of the UN Decade of Family Farming, which in turn will accelerate the achievement of the SDGs, especially SDG 1, No Poverty, and SDG 2, End Hunger, Promote Food Security, and Sustainable Agriculture. We look forward to your utmost support. Long live! Family farmers, thank you for your attention. No farmer, no food, no future. No farmer, no food, no future. No patani. No patani. Hamsab eke. Hamsab eke. My boy, Pamir Magsisaka. Family farmers. Family farmers. From the video. We have seen how family farmers also play an important role as frontliners during this pandemic. The pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerabilities of our smallholder food producers. Nevertheless, in the stories, we have seen that the family farmer truly are also agents of development. Having said that, let's hear directly from a young farmer himself about how their organization and their families respond to the challenges confronting them during this pandemic. Let's welcome Mr. Jumer Markaida, Young Farmer Representative from AFA Pakisama. Hello, Jumer. Based hello. on, hello there. <laughs> Based on our uh, on your experience in Pakisama, Philippines, how are the family farmers, especially young farmers, and their organizations coping during this pandemic? What are the actions that your uh, that your group has taken so far, and have you participated in any of the government programs? Uh, just more hi na aldaw sa Indugabos. Uh, good morning. Mabuay. I am Jumar Bueno Marcaida, uh, General Manager of Golden Para Parauma Producers Cooperative and the Young Farmer Representative of AFA and Pakisama. So I am here to present to you the response of family farmers, especially the young farmers here in Philippines. Next. The impact of the current pandemic. First, the limitations in mobility in doing farm work due to limited mode of transportation and also the restrictions in going out of 21 years old and below. Next, difficulty in accessing educational opportunities because nowadays the applications and admission procedures are shipped to online mode. Then, difficulty in organizing and participating to online activities and discussions due to limited internet connections, especially in remote or rural areas, like participation to meetings, like this webinar. Uh, we are limited 
to participate. Then, difficulty in accessing government programs because of the lack of adequate information on how to avail existing projects or programs. Then there is also an inconsistency in local government units in implementing the in relief and support operations. Then, especially the marketing and processing of produce. We are limited because of the delivery of farmers' produce are limited. Uh, the mode of transportation is uh, limited due to lockdown. Then we can transport the local produce to the main market, especially in the cities. And the lack of processing areas and other processing equipment. Next. Besides of these difficulties, we do local initiatives and interventions. First, in our local cooperative, we establish Young Farmers Cooperative Farm or Yofa Kofa. We provide agri-extension services and support to the young farmers by means of production support, in organizing, in teaching them how to market their goods, local, local offline and online. Then we establish also local food market while we are undergoing a enhanced community quarantine. So we, we cater the local government unit, unit and the local community. By this, uh, we empower the economic and strengthen also the collaboration with the local government unit. Next, utilizing social media for online marketing of products. We sell our products by using Facebook, by Messenger, by uh, online. Then we continued engagement and partnership with government agencies and non-government agencies. This is through strengthening the three P's or the public and private partner, partnership mode, model. Then participation to online discussions organized by various groups and networks like this uh, program by Asia DRA and other NGOs. We do participating of all uh, necessary webinars. We, we conduct dialogue with food frontliners and also attending and participating any webinar that can uh, help us in fighting this COVID pandemic. Then we share also our blessings because uh, the government also uh, give us a subsidy, especially the seeds and other inputs. So we share the, the, the receive uh, inputs with our members and also the non-members especially in the local community. Then we push this organized youth groups within the mother organization or cooperative because it is the key strategy in pushing the agenda of the young farmers and the opportunity as high time to raise their voice. Next. In line with this, this is the pictures of our uh, Young Farmers Cooperative Farm, how we uh, organize them, how we uh, uh, make them experience the uh, extension works in uh, traveling uh, four hours up planned hiking uh, from the highway up to the uh, farthest uh, location of our cooperative. So while uh, we are walking, we, uh, we teach them in a uh, we teach them in organizing extension works, in uh, not uh, in uh, observing the na, na, the environment that affects the uh, the agricultural system. So below, uh, they conduct the young farmers cooperative farm by uh, manual uh, tilling the land, and also they also. Uh, participate in harvesting our uh, cooperative farm produce. Next. This is also uh, in relation with the Young Farmers Cooperative Farm, Young Farmers in Action. At the middle, uh, uh, the upper middle uh, picture, it is, we call this uh, not only, not just only Young Farmers Cooperative Farm, but 
Family Farmers Cooperative Farm because uh, our youth with their uh, uh, with their respective uh, parents and uh, grandmothers, uh, we help each other in um, establishing the family farms, uh, family cooperative farm or Papa Kofa, family farmers cooperative farm. That's it. So this is not just uh, for young farmers, but we also uh, encourage the participation of their uh, family members. Next. Aside from uh, the initiative of our local cooperative, uh, other farmer organizations of Pakisama and AFA also do uh, small steps towards the fight towards fighting the COVID-19 to cope with COVID-19. For example, the Madasi Young Farmers Organization of Bula Kamarinisur, uh, they, they initiate uh, Gulayan sa community project or uh, vegetable farm in a community. Uh, they, in, they entice the, uh, the youth to help in uh, cultivating their uh, land. Next. Also, all over the country, the, uh, in, at the upper uh, left cor uh, corner, uh, he is a farmer in uh, Bohol, Philippines. Uh, because of the uh, access in land, he, he has the decision in uh, cultivating the farmland uh, inherited from her, from his, uh, from his parents. So, aside from this, uh, aside from these initiatives, uh, many local farmers, local young farmers, initiate by their own ways. Next. And this is also the other initiatives of family farmers linking farmers to consumers. This is the initiative of Pakisama linking the uh, family farmers, especially the women in agriculture. They are not just women in agriculture, but they are uh, indigenous people that uh, lead the, their own uh, cooperative. So this is the uh, uh it was already presented by Miss Esther Pinunya a while ago. So that's it. It's Kegat or Kababaihang Dumagat ng Shera Madre. Next. And due to the lockdown, uh, many cooperative uh, become more uh, imaginative, become more uh, productive. So because of of the lockdown, uh, there is a positive uh, aspect also due to the strengthening of the co-op market enterprise by means of value addition, by means of local marketing. Just like in our cooperative, uh, we, aside from uh, produ uh, production of uh, fresh products or fresh vegetables, we also make this for value addition, just like vegetable pizza, uh, pepino chips or cucumber chips and other uh, uh, products like rice base, uh, like rice from organic rice from Patanum in Iloilo, uh, rice based uh, food from uh, Perak and other uh, cooperatives of Pakisama. Next. Because of this pandemic, some are uh, shift their uh, professions, like fishers. They're, because of pandemic, they are just not like uh, fisher only, but they become also farmers. Like, uh, like this um, at the upper right uh, corner, he's a fisher and he plant for his family, then second to the community. In short, no farmer, no food, no future. Next. This, this also continued partnership with government and development partners. Uh, government helped us in, uh, uh, 
in procurement of uh, production uh, inputs and also processing equipments and other, uh, just an example, solar irrigation. Next. And also the Lakambini or the women arm of Pakisama. Lakambini Bulan Sorsogon has the rolling women led by vegetable store. Next. Because of these initiatives, we highly recommend the creation of Young Farmers Committee within the mother organization or association because it strengthened the rule of young farmers and it also raised the voice of the youth. Full value chain support to family farmers from production, processing, and marketing, provision of farm inputs and machineries, provision of incentives, for example, recognition to the outstanding family farmers continued engagement with government agencies and for public program accessing and partnership, continued engagement and partnership with development partners, utilize various social media platforms to attract youth in agriculture. For example, uh, IAC, IAC materials, information, education, and communication materials, cross-sectoral approach and ensuring gender justice in farm farming, yeah, not just young farmers, but young fishers, young ip farmers and young wa women farmers uh, women <laughs> farmers of young farmers as sectors of the community and lobbying for the enactment of proposed legis legislations that will benefit and recognize the rights of family farmers like magna carta of farming family farmers and also magna carta of young farmers in short next Support young farmers, support food frontliners. Next. Because of this pandemic, I really I did realize that alone I am weak, but with others I am strong. And if we are together, we are stronger. Cooperation is the solution. Thank you. Mabuhay. Thank you, Jomer. Thank you so much. And I would just like to recap some of what he said. He emphasized the need to strengthen the role of young farmers, among which are through creating a young farmers committee within the farmers organization, recognizing them as a valuable sector of the community, utilizing social media platforms to attract youth in the agriculture, continued partnership and uh, engagement with the government and development partners, as well as lobbying for the Magna Carta of Young Farmers. Thank you again, Jomer. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Grigorio, where we've just heard actual stories from the ground, sir, but from your perspective, how vulnerable are the ASEAN smallholders during this pandemic? What are the immediate actions needed to respond to gaps in terms of policies and programs? And are there scientific or academic researches that point us to certain directions or new ways or approaches? Yeah. Dr. Gregorio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. And thanking you for this opportunity for me to to speak in behalf of CIRCA of what we think about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on agricultural production in Southeast Asia. So give me a chance to talk to you and good afternoon. Greetings to Asia Ra. A pleasant good afternoon to all. And I like the passion of Jomer here. We have the youth uh, inter agri entrepreneur who wants really to show that we could do something and uh, we have we have a lot of limitations especially what i could note there is the prohibition of uh, 21 years old and below so now okay that's my second slide uh if there's one key lesson from our agricultural experience with covid-19 pandemic pandemic it is in terms of how important food agricultural food system is and how fragile 
and vulnerable it could be particularly during the time of pandemic. So in this slide, you could see here, I just want to share to you our newly published paper at the Asian Journal of Agriculture and Development. And just making sure that my voice is okay. I hope this is okay. So we have this journal, we just published this journal, this article on impact of COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture production in Southeast Asia. And uh, if to summarize them all, which I'll be going to the details later, the disruption in agriculture food system creates supply and demand shock, shocks after immediate and long-term economic performance and food security. So you see COVID-19 re resulted in 3.11% or more than 17 million tons reduction in aggregate volume of production due to the decline in agri agricultural farm labor. This affects about 100, more than 100 million people. This could result in a 1.7, 1 1.4% decrease in the gross domestic product of the Southeast Asia, which is equivalent to 3.76 billion US dollar. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we can better appreciate the impact of COVID-19 if we look into the food security situation in Southeast Asia. To do, the, to do so, let's look at the Global Food Security Index. This is the uh, index where the highest, the higher the Global Food Security Index score of a country, the more food security. So the higher the value, those graph on the upper part, they are more food secure. So based on the data from 2015 to 2019, the food security conditions of Southeast Asian countries varies largely. You could see there as low as almost 25% uh, up to almost 100% for Singapore and Brunei. So you could see this, the likes of Singapore and Malaysia having the higher, higher global food security index scores. So they are more food secure, while countries like Laos, Myanmar and Cambodia have relatively lower global food security index score. Take a closer look into the case, look at the case of the Philippines and other countries in Southeast Asia. As our global food security index scores for the past year have not significantly increased. So we can ask here, how can we strengthen agriculture in these countries to ensure food security? So while looking at this graph, Please remember two things. One is the need to sustain the contribution of agriculture to food security goals. For a country like the Philippines, agriculture remains to play a crucial role in achieving food security, both in the supply and demand side, particularly among the small holding communities. So we are focusing on the small holding culture. They are the much affected. Farm produce remain in the source of protein, carbohydrates, and fiber in the farming families. And the source of income to buy food and services relevant to this food sustenance and nutrition as well. Second, we can observe the increase in the global food security index course of Southeast Asian countries from 2017 to 2019. You can see it's going up from 2017, going up slowly and expected to go upward. But this had been halted by the productivity reduction due to COVID-19 in 2020. So could you see here, if you go 2020, it might go down because of this problem. I'm sure of that. Next slide, please. Okay, in this one, you can see the number of undernourished people in South Asia for the year 2010 to 20 cents, uh, 2017 ranges from almost 60 a uh, million to 74 million people. That's about five to seven times the size of population of, uh, of Manila. And about nine to 12% of the total population of Southeast Asia are undernourished. So you can see here in the data of 2017, highest prevalence of undernourished in terms of percentage of the total 
population of the country was noted in Lao PDR, which is 16.5%, Cambodia about 16.4%. Of course, while the lowest was in Singapore, which is zero, the richer side of Southeast Asia, and Malaysia, which is 2.5%. So clearly, agriculture must not just aim for increased food production, but also to improve the nutritional status of the population. This is a lesson that I want to, to highlight for the Philippines as well, which we have 15%. The budget, the next slide, please. If you go to the next slide, you will see that the value chain shows that the linkage between the supply and demand in our agricultural food systems, which was uh, discussed a little bit in the uh, other videos. And due to the lockdown, Mobility restriction results to the quality restriction in farm labor, which it continues, if continue, it continues longer, would translate to overall reduction in agricultural producti productivity, which we are experiencing, experiencing now. Agricultural production reductions is also caused by farmers' limited access to farm inputs and access to market to sell produce, which may result to profit losses and waste stage of farm produce. The loss of income. An economic slowdown would also result in the decrease in the demand, particularly among farmers and farming families with no safety nets. So among Asian countries, agriculture remain to be the major source of direct em employment. So we are much affected. If you go to the next slide, please. This is the percent change in volume of agricultural production due to the decrease in agricultural labor force. So among the countries, so it's quite regular. See there, it's we have all reduced. Among the countries most affected in the decline in agricultural labor, su labor supply was Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, which shows an estimated reduction uh, about 3.8, 3.6, 3.28, respectively. If you go to the next slide, you could see here the decrease in labor productivity due to COVID-19 would translate in reduction of the gross domestic products among Southeast Asian countries. So this is very clear that this decrease in the GNP, gross domestic product, would mean more families being pushed below the poverty line. Poverty impact in Southeast Asia would reach the additional of almost 15 million families to live below poverty line. And uh, this would push back the ability of most of the countries in Southeast Asia to reduce their poverty reduction target as set in their commitment in SDG 2020. So most how could not go to reduce poverty uh, commitment. Next slide. If you go to the next slide, you could, we could show here, here the different programs and in initiative across the supply chain in response to COVID-19. This is an example of the Philippines and most of the Southeast Asian countries. All these initiatives have wide coverage, spanning from mobility restriction impact on farmers, processors, and distributors due to lock, lockdowns and community quarantines. Some retailers may have experienced increase in food prices due to unpredictable market, thanks to price freeze during the state of calamity declaration by the governments. On the other hand, COVID-19 have resulted to change in the consumer's preference. Many of the consumers now eat more healthy foods, vegetables, fruits, and they are more um, uh, health conscious. Next slide, please. So if you could see the next slide, I want to sh show here today to tell you a story of hope and something that is concrete and is surely achievable. Our experience with COVID-19 has surely enabled us to rethink how to approach the and view agriculture, how we view production, and ho how we view food, even the, everything. I am here to convince you that there is a need to, for an accelerated transformation in agriculture sector, so it can be fully utilized, maximized for human well-being. We at Cherka have been inspired by this and have designed our 11 five-year plan which we start actually this month to essentially accelerate transformation through agricultural innovation, or we call it attain. That's the word attain. 
Next slide, please. If you show, I want, uh, I'll just zoom up uh, on that other slide. Please take note that the innovations we're repairing here requires a new mindset. So we have the new thinking where farming is viewed as sustainable agribusiness. This is a contrast to the traditional view that farming is merely about production. So we have to think it as a business. So we now espouse about ecosystem thinking, circle, circular value chain, future proof products and services, low or even zero ecological footprints, agri, agriculture 4.0, and the need for the next agriculture and rural development transformative leaders for Southeast Asia and of course in the Philippines. Next slide, please. As in this next, next slide, if you look down, I will say that much of what is needed to transform the agricultural production system in Southeast Asia is also similar to that of the Philippines. This therefore must, be, must excite us about the future of agriculture holds for us. But we need to get things right. Next slide, please. In the next slide, I just want to show you the agricultural innovation and agricultural conservation could partner together. We could have agricultural innovation at the same time, uh, uh, biological conservation, a win-win proposition for Southeast Asia. We could partner together. And this is the new better normal that we have to think of. As we innovate agriculture, we have to think about uh, uh, bio, uh, biodiversity conservation. So in order to apply holistic agricultural innovation across the food value chains, it is critical to appreciate how much human being is underpinned by biodiversity rich agricultural food system. Next slide. Now I am proposing in the next line, what we are advocating the academe industry government inter interconnectivity model. This is the point for the production sector to respond to COVID-19 crisis. One, you can see here the supporting local capacity towards being self-sufficient through well-planned production and post-production system, promotion in incentive system to support innovation studies, to improve the um, production and post-production, increase efficiency and value adding activities, and also uh, designing the financial technologies to empower farmers and rural development. So we have to use technologies, financial technologies. Next slide, please. If you see in this slide, it is a continuation of the academic industry connectivity. We, I may say as a consumer, we are more aware of the intricate link between the plate and the farm uh, response, and, plate and farm responsible consumption practices and lifestyle might be actively promoted through lifelong, lifelong education. So we have to incorporate it in our education system. That's why I call it reimagined environmental education. Sustaining more targeted capacity building activities is needed to support growing interest in agriculture and biodiversity. And of course, more agri-entrepreneurship where the youth and the women engagement is needed towards uh, in our agriculture and rural development. So at the, uh, at the macro level, policy supporting the trade in Southeast Asia must be designed to support productive and inclusive agricultural systems that both ensure food security and environmental conservation. This is where the Asian Economic Corporation has a vital importance. Next slide, please. I think I just want to show you in my last slide to show that we are developing a lot of policy, brief policy papers on in response to COVID-19 like this one. You could download, download most of this from our web circa website, like policy imperatives to promote urban agriculture in response to COVID-19 pandemic among local government units in the Philippines. And the other one is uh, agricultural clusters approach to enhance competitiveness of smallholder farms in Southeast Asia. This is my last slide. I want just to show you my last slide, which is the slide of CIRCA. I just want to introduce CIRCA, the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, aims to be the leading enabler and champion of excellence in agriculture and rural development in Southeast Asia. So in the next five years, 
SHERCA's mission is to elevate the quality of life of agricultural families to sustainable livelihood and access to modern networks and innovative markets. To do markets, innovative markets. To do this, SHERCA commits to a better, bigger, smarter outcomes. So thank you and God bless our farmers and their farming uh, for and, uh, and their families. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din, Glenn. Thank you so much. Thank you for the data. The statistics you showed were really eye-openers. And even if you shared some that said uh, COVID-19 pandemic has created supply and demand shocks affecting all relevant sectors, including especially the agriculture sector, you said there is hope that we can rethink how we see agriculture, production and food, and uh, through your acronym, you said ATEI, Accelerate, uh, Transform Thinking. Transformation. Transformation through Thinking agricultural through Agricultural innovation. innovation. And you also shared with us a model. Uh, this is the... Uh, Academy. Yes, let me look Academy. at my notes. Uh, it's a model on uh, academe, industry, government, interconnectivity model, which is very, we can really explore further and look at how this can work in the context of our country and in the context of the COVID situation. So thank you again, Glenn. Uh, now I'd like to ask, M Michael from Pau. Good, good day, Michael. Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> so from uh, Pau's viewpoint during this pandemic and beyond, how important is it to have responsible public and or private investments in agricultural sector? How have family farmers, especially young farmers, been benefiting from agricultural investments? And what are the opportunities that await the youth in agricultural sectors, especially in the context of the pandemic? Michael? Hey. Thanks so much. And thanks for having me today. I appreciate very much that Asia Draw has made this opportunity. So hi to everyone, and thank you also for, for your time to join with us today. Um, you'll see on the slide here, my name is Michael, uh, Michael Riggs. I am the team leader for Responsible Agricultural Investment, uh, but I'm based in FAO headquarters uh, in Rome, Italy. So I'm speaking to you today from Italy. Um, in the past, I was based in Bangkok. I used to be, for 10 years, I was at the regional office in Bangkok. So I know the region well, and my team still covers, um, covers the globe, but uh, I still do a lot of work in Asia. And I'd also like to thank really uh, Jumer and um, Glenn, the speakers before me, for really setting the stage for, for what I'm about to say. So first you heard from Jumer about really the importance of youth in, in agriculture and what's important to young people. And then Glenn talked about really the need to transform and how are we going to transform yeah. uh, agriculture and food systems. We're going to do this through innovation and investment. And when we talk about investment, we're talking from FAO, we're talking not only about investing in the financial sense, of course, the financial sense is very important, but we're going to talk about investing in people, investing in youth, investing in women, uh, and by making these investments, transforming our food systems, and making us more able to cope with COVID, but also future crises. Okay. So the next slide, please. I actually would like to start backing up for a minute. Um, we're very conscious of what's going on right now, but I think it's important to remember back to January or even December um, of last year, where were we before this happened and, and what were we doing? Because I think it's very relevant to what's happening now. And in fact, we need to do more of what we were trying to do um, to ensure that we recover from the COVID crisis quickly and that we don't suffer so much in the next time another pandemic comes along. Next slide, please. So really what we're looking at, what FAO is looking at is working with governments, but also farmers, organizations, producers, <coughs> uh, foresters and fishers 
to support achieving SDGs 1 and 2. And simply put, SDG 1 is to eliminate poverty and SDG 2 is to eliminate hunger. But we've got a pretty big challenge, as this graph here shows us. Next slide, please. But we know that investing in agriculture is actually one of the most effective ways to eliminate poverty and eliminate hunger. Right? And FAO and IFAD and WFP some years ago estimated that the world needs to invest an additional $140 billion every year in agriculture and productive activities in forestry and fisheries in order to reach SDGs 1 and 2 to eliminate poverty and eliminate hunger by 2030. Next slide, please. But again, if we look back to where we were before COVID struck, while in Southeast Asia, this graph here, if you look at the blue bar on the left, it shows that in Southeast Asia, about a third of the population is employed in agriculture, in the agricultural sector. Um, but that it only includes, it only provides about 10% of the GDP, the gross domestic product, which is the second bar. So a lot of people are employed, but it's not as big in the part of it, our economy in Southeast Asia as it used to be. And for this reason, maybe sometimes it doesn't get as much attention as it should, particularly from, from people in government and policies, but also people in the financial sector. And what's really telling and important here is when we think about investing in agriculture, there are many ways to measure it. But one proxy is to look at the amount of credits that are given to the agricultural sector compared to the total amount of credit available. And you see the blue bar on the right, it's tiny. It's a very, very small amount. So what this indicates is while we know that food is important and we <clears> know that we're trying to eliminate hunger and eliminate poverty and agriculture employs a lot of people in, in the region, there isn't very much investment in the sector. And this is a problem. Next slide, please. So if you had a chance to watch um, the video, FAO video at the very beginning, when there were a series of videos shown before the speakers began, you'll have seen that actually one of the areas where we're looking to focus is on the issue of investment and youth. And why? Why, why youth? Why there are many areas of investment, as I mentioned, but youth are particularly important to us, we recognize, because youth are the future of food security. Um, if young people are not interested in agriculture, if they're not bringing their own new ideas to agriculture, we're going to have a serious problem going forward. Um, never mind eliminating hunger due to the growth of the population. We need to increase our, our food production by 60% by the year 2050. This is a lot. Also employment, agriculture provides a tremendous opportunity to employ young people. And when we talk about employment in agriculture, we don't only mean production agriculture. So not only the people working in the fields or working in the sea, but also young people working in um, related industries, whether it's processing products or providing new products from agriculture. Um, this is great opportunity here. And this is true in Southeast Asia, but also actually globally. And then young people are important for rural communities to thrive. So the greatest amount of poverty in the world is always found in rural areas. And one of the problems is young people tend to leave rural areas looking for new economic opportunities in cities or sometimes even in other countries. And by investing in young people and agriculture, we can help reverse this trend. We can help give young people who want to stay in rural areas a, a reason to stay and an opportunity to develop their own lives, to have families and to be successful there. Next slide, please. But through FAO's research, and it was discussed, I think, much more eloquently, actually, by Joomer, we've identified a series of issues and published articles on these issues about young people who are really struggling to, to become involved in the agricultural sector, to become entrepreneurs, to provide agricultural services. There aren't enough services, there aren't enough policies, there aren't enough legal frameworks, there aren't enough loans that are focused on the special needs of young people. Extension doesn't focus on young people. And then when young people are in rural areas, they're often not adequately, adequately connected 
to, to opportunities to learn, to opportunities to learn again about new technologies, for opportunities to access markets and increase their own productivity. So all of these things, we, we need to invest in young people, but there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of issues that prevent them from investing themselves. Okay, so this is sort of the background of where we're at, and this is what we knew and what we were trying to address up until January of this year. Next slide, please. And all of this actually still makes sense, but it's actually become even more urgent in the context of today. Where are we now? We're in the middle of a global pandemic, something that I believe none of us have seen in our lifetime. Um, Many of us have faced challenges. There have been issues related to climate change, to weather, to uh, the economic crisis um, around 2008 and the earlier one, those of us who are older remember 1998, but this is something different, right? This is a global pandemic. It's impacting everybody, but it's having a particular impact on rural areas and our food producers. Next slide, please. So, a lot has been written about this. We saw some very interesting information provided by, by Glenn that CIRC has been working on. But generally, we know that this global pandemic is having a severe impact on agriculture and our food supplies, particularly because it's disrupted value chains. It's disrupted them because people aren't allowed to move. Farmers, in some cases, can't get to land or they can't get their produce to markets. People can't get to markets. Food can't be shipped. Um, people can't move easily. And this is creating also, there's an economic crisis, both for our agricultural communities, but for our consumers of agricultural products. And a lot of this is related to unemployment and income loss. So what does this mean? We knew from data that I showed you in the past that there needed to be more investment in the agricultural sector. But now in the face of the COVID crisis, it's even more urgent. There needs to be even more investment and we need it now more than ever. Next slide, please. At the same time, so we need more investment, but the COVID pandemic actually is threatening investment in the agricultural sector even more. So it's sort of like what we would call a double whammy, right? Um, agricultural production is limited, the demand from consumers may be limited because of their ability to move or their loss of income, but COVID itself is going to decrease flows of foreign direct investment. Um, it's going to decrease remittances, money coming in from family members overseas due to their mm. reduced things where they are. And we're probably going to face governments or public sector budgets that are greatly constrained in their ability to invest further because governments are already putting out a tremendous amount of money to deal with the immediate health crisis of COVID. And I think we could add to this, unfortunately, we're expecting that ODI, foreign development in investment is probably also going to go down because the countries that provide most of our ODI are also under great strain by, because of this camp pandemic. And we know we have lots of data from around the world to show that unfortunately, COVID is going to have a particularly acute impact on young people. Um, we already have globally a large percentage of youth who are not employed or not in education or training. We already have youth unemployment that's about three times as high as those of adults. And all of this is going to be made worse by the pandemic. Um, young people who are working in the agricultural sector are more likely to become unemployed before older people will. Young people are more likely to be working on informal contracts that don't give them job security, that don't give them social protection. So we've really got, as I said, a, quite a conundrum, quite a confluence of many problems coming together here. So what can we do? We need to know about these problems. We need to be very concerned, but how can we be positive about this? Where are the opportunities to move ahead? Next slide, please. So the first thing we have to emphasize is that above all, it's everybody's job, that of the UN, but also of governments and of individuals to ensure that we're all kept safe and healthy to the best of our ability. So first we have to consider all this, but in the context of ensuring safety and health, we do need to think now about building back better. 
and how can we do this? So where should we be investing? We need to invest more in agriculture and food systems. We already knew this. We need to invest more in young people and we need to help young people invest themselves. But in the context of COVID, we should be looking at things like shortening the supply chains, right? bringing food closer from the supplier to the producer closer, because this will help eliminate some of the problems of reduced mobility during COVID. We need to invest in worker safety. One of the biggest issues has been in food processing, where workers were working closely together, and currently they can't work because of the safety issues. So how can we increase worker safety to ensure that our food supplies are continuing, but also that those workers have safe, decent employment? We need to look more carefully at investing in technology. Um, Jumer talked a lot about the importance of his farmer groups marketing their products now online. Um, so I would call this e-commerce, a way again to shorten the distance between the food suppliers and the food buyers. We need to look at new creative financial products. This is a huge area for, for work. We need financial products that not only are geared to serve large scale corporations, but also that look to work with producer organizations that are geared specifically towards farmers or fisher folk or foresters, but also youth specific products. It's really important. Youth have very particular financial needs um, that need to be addressed. And we need what we call blended products. So a blended product is where different groups come together to combine money to make funds available where they wouldn't be otherwise. So one example is the government may make available a small amount of money to reduce the risk of investing in young entrepreneurs. And then by reducing the risk, then banks will come in to lend more. Yes. And in that last area that is very important, and I won't go into it too much because of time, but we need to work with our governments to ensure that we're creating the right incentives for investment. Right? All of our governments have investment, some form of investment promotion or investment policy, or even laws that regulate where investments can go, who gets tax breaks, who doesn't get tax breaks, who can invest in land, who can't invest in land. These need to be correct. They need to be driving these types of investment we need now. They need to look for investments that ensure worker safety. They need to provide incentives for investments that will shorten the supply chain. They need to push investments towards investing in young people. Um, so it's really important that we look at creating these better incentives. Next slide, please. So very briefly, I've talked about through the whole thing, we know we need more investment. We need to invest more specifically now, particularly in areas related to youth, in shortening the food supply. But we need, as I said, the right incentives. It's not enough just to have more investment. And I won't go into this in great detail. I think people are pretty aware these days that when investments aren't done well, they create a lot of problems. Actually, in the 2008 food price crisis, we had examples of investment in agriculture where it actually created increased food insecurity because there are investments made that shifted production away from either the local food market or that shifted out of food crops into non-food crops. Uh, so these created more problems. We have had investment cases where large-scale investment in lands has created problems for access to natural resources, but also tenure rights of people. And, and there are many more examples. So we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. So we have to be very conscious of what we need now, but how to ensure that these investments are what we call responsible or sustainable investments. Investments that ensure that the businesses, whether the business is an individual, a young farmer, a cooperative or a big corporation, that those businesses will be sustainable and profitable but at the same time, it needs to not create risk for everyone else, not create risk for the community where it exists, not create risk for the environment. Next slide, please. And the best tool we have available to us, one of the guiding tools we have to available is to ensure that investments are not only more, but better, that they're responsible, is actually the ASEAN guide for promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture and forestry. So these guidelines were released by the ASEAN in consultation with all your member governments in the region. Um, 
to explain what ASEAN considers to be a responsible investment, but also how it should be done. And this is based on the global work of the Committee on World Food Security. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for listening. I want to just emphasize again that we realize that investments are essential and investing now is what's going to help accelerate our community's recoveries from the COVID crisis, but ensure that we're more resilient when the next crisis comes along. And if you have time and are interested um, on this slide, you'll see some resources where you can look more into details about specific issues, both to what makes investment responsible, but also COVID issues related to Southeast Asia and Asia the Pacific for agriculture, forestry, and the fisheries sector, and for youth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for reiterating that engaging and empowering the youth to invest and to benefit from investment is crucial for food security, employment, and thriving rural communities. Like you said, we have to build back better now through investment in short supply chain, worker safety, technology, new financial production, and um, create right incentive for investment. Thank you again, Michael. We'll get back to you later with some of the questions from our participants. Let us also hear the perspective from the private sector. Uh, Reggie, good day. Good afternoon, Arlene. Thank you Hello. for welcoming me here. Yes. Uh, could you please tell us how important is investing in smallholder agriculture in ensuring resiliency of food value chain during and beyond the pandemic? Also, what are innovative partnerships do you foresee that will help smallholders build back better? Definitely. Um, so let me try to answer your second question on innovative partnerships first and then okay. go back to the importance of resilient uh, food value chains. Certainly. So um, let's go to my first slide, the next one after this. The pandemic has not spared farmers nor has it spared the traders, the logistics operators, the processors and food manufacturing companies down the chain. Um, quite a few surveys have been taken uh, and this is an example done by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or GAME with a focus on SMEs in low to middle income countries. Now, most companies are seeing decreased sales and thus mm -hmm. resulting cash. And this resulting cash crunch means that they also have difficulty paying their employees or suppliers, or they can't pay for raw materials, which also meant decreased or stopped production, again, contributing to the negative impact up and down the supply chain. So to your question, we see four common themes emerging around logistics issues, cash flow, marketing or distribution, and then the information, particularly communicating with smallholders. Uh, I'll discuss these four partnerships shortly. So let me now go back to your first question on investing in smallholder agriculture. Next slide, please. And this is another survey uh, by PwC and Food Industry Asia as to what the private sector thinks are the implications for the future of food value chains. You asked about investing in smallholder agriculture, and I expect that the diversification of customer bases, but also the supplier base will increase, especially as businesses reduce their exposure to individual geographies. Um, when you consider that smallholders produce a third to half of the world's food, it is imperative that agribusinesses work with smallholders to keep this health crisis also from turning into a food crisis, as Esther mentioned. Before we leave this slide, I want to point out some of the trends in the horizon, such as the changing consumer consumption patterns or focus on food safety or what Michael said, the disintermediation in the supply chain that brings producers closer to the end consumer. Uh, these started before the lockdowns and COVID has only accelerated them. The opportunity here is to use people's willingness to change during these extraordinary times to build back better, as you say. Um, so next slide, please. Um, this is where I talk about the four partnerships. Um, okay, let, let's do two at a time. 
Croatia has started convening working groups around these four areas we identified. Um, there are certainly short-term solutions that can be done, but we are also looking for innovative ways to protect supply chains against both future pandemics and other unforeseen events in the long term. For example, in rural, rural logistics, um, supply chain bottlenecks or the inability to ship out the harvests have resulted in products being thrown away. Uh, in the short term, uh, the private sector has worked with governments to ensure green lanes <laughs> where food uh, and food and agriculture workers are Sorry for that. Where, where food and food and agriculture workers are considered essential services and allowed to move despite the lockdown. But how else can we improve rural logistics, particularly the first mile connectivity, the one that you know picks up from the farm gate? Um, and, and you know what Grab has done in Southeast Asian cities? Can we bring uh, to rural logistics this innovation seen in urban logistics? to consolidate loads, fill up trucks that might otherwise return empty, or work with people who have idle vehicles but looking for income. You know, these this, this are food for thought. Uh, I move on to cash flow. You know, I mentioned that because farmers are not able to sell their produce, they don't have the cash to make the necessary investments in their next crop. Uh, some governments, donors, input suppliers are stepping in to provide farmers with starter kits of, of seeds and fertilizers for, for next season's planting. Uh, at the same time, is this an opportunity to increase the financial access of rural communities by promoting e-wallets and mobile money? You know, donors are thinking of complementing this with e-vouchers to transfer needed credit to farmers to buy inputs and plan for the next season. But it requires uh, a supporting ecosystem of input dealers from which farmers can buy fertilizers and seeds with the vouchers. Uh, and, and an even bigger question could be, you know, the creation of a formal farmer registry to know who to transfer the money to. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third area was on new marketing channels. You know, some actions have been taken to redistribute excess produce in one area to minimize food loss. For example, the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture, PPSA, um, this is the country partnership that Grow Asia supports in the Philippines, was involved in the Bayanihan Musikahan, and they connected them with a nationwide network of farmer cooperatives. Aggregating the produce under these cooperatives and then organizing them with volunteer truckers, you know, the food and personal protection packs were delivered to more than 90,000 families. Um, in my earlier slide just now on changing consumer patterns, especially on e-commerce, digital marketplaces allows this direct purchase from farmers to consumers and or agribusinesses. You know, I like uh, Jumer's story about how they were able to use Facebook uh, to sell their produce. Um, in Malaysia, uh, growers who were typically selling their produce in Singapore, you know, because again of the border uh, closures turned to Lazada's platform to sell their produce in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and, you know, a very big example in China, Pintuotuo, which is one of the top three e-commerce platforms there, you know, are, is able to move about 20 billion of agricultural goods annually to, to, to show you the, the, the potential of, of scale. Um, and then the fourth one, lastly, is there a way of reimagining the way we communicate with farmers beyond, you know, traditional radio, TV, or the internet? Um, I, I think some farmers today maybe have access already to, to smartphones through their children, or they probably use Facebook or, or some, I guess, uh, minimal minimalist type of chat platforms. Um, and so when you think about many of us are familiar with the concept of influencers on social media, right, with, with lots of followers, can we employ the same approach um, to work with farmer champions or government extension agents to, to guide the conversations and inject the advice or, or information online and, and disseminate, disseminate this. Um, so in summary, um, you know, these four areas of innovative partnerships uh, have been coming out of the issues that COVID has revealed in our food system. Um, when I listen to Jumer's presentation and, and again to, to Michael's emphasis of working with the youth, I wonder almost if these can also serve as opportunities for young people, uh, especially those that are more 
technologically savvy and and comfortable uh you know with the use of of these new tech uh, the problem of of working with digital solutions so next slide please and then in May earlier this year, uh, Grow Asia convened over 100 senior leaders from the private sector, the public sector, and civil society in response to ASEAN's call for multi-stakeholder partnership solutions. Um, so those four themes uh, definitely came up in the conversation. And we are also aware of two initiatives starting to make traction. Um, so in Cambodia, um, this is an is initiative being led by a leading mobile money operator called Wing Money. You know, it is supported also by uh, our Cambodian Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, then the government there has used the mobile wallet network of Wing Money. They signed up the eligible recipients uh, with Wing's e-wallets. And then thereafter, those people can withdraw cash from, from the Wing's uh, booths or use it as mobile money. And then the World Bank is thinking of potentially using the same mechanism to distribute uh, electronic vouchers. Uh, with that e-wallet, I think some of the, they are approaching um, a network of, of agribusinesses as well to, to, to see whether they can launch an e-commerce and digital marketplace. Um, a similar evolution is happening in Myanmar, where a group, again, of, of mobile money operators are discussing with the World Bank on how to deliver uh, e-vouchers for farmers to buy inputs uh, and then to be complemented also by e-extension services. So e-extension services are, I guess, the non-physical uh, uh, interaction between the government agents and, and the farmers that they, that they support, which is particularly, particularly re relevant in today's uh, COVID times. Uh, this brings me to my final slide, uh, the next one. And then at the ASEAN level, you know, Grow Asia has convened specialist working groups around these four themes to develop an action plan with defined roles and responsibilities. Um, we, we are able, uh, we're very glad to see strong private uh, sector support. About 40% of the 70 plus organizations have already, you know, want, uh, raised their hand in wanting to participate in the working groups. Uh, so maybe I'll end here maybe with, with, uh, with an invitation. Feel free to contact me if, if you'd like to be involved in these working groups as we try to look at, you know, what are some possibilities of, of new partnerships that we can look at at the regional level. Um, that brings me back to my presentation, Arlene. Happy to discuss more with my fellow panelists. Back to you, Arlene. Thank you so much, uh, Reggie. Thank you also for sharing innovative innovations, short-term actions in areas of rural logistics, cash flow, new marketing channels, and uh, farmer communication. I'm sure our participants will be excited to try this out in their own context. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. I'd like to thank all the panelists for your uh, very insightful inputs. We will now open the discussion from interventions and questions from our participants. Okay, so earlier we received several requests for interventions. We'll first entertain three interventions and then we'll uh, let the panelists respond afterwards. If we still have time, we will entertain more questions. Okay, so for the Participants, if you are using Zoom, please raise your hand if you want to have intervention or type in your question and comments on the Q&A or chat box. If you are viewing from Facebook, please put your interventions in the comment box. Yes, so uh, I have three questions here. Let me pull it out quick. Okay, uh, first question from For Pakisama. This is from Jose Mondred C. His question is, in the Philippines in particular, how can young farmers go and work on the land or farms and sell their harvest despite the lockdown restrictions imposed by the national government? Anyone from Pakisama? Chomer? By, simply by means of local, plant local and sell it local. Then uh, we push the support local, buy local, eat local to the consumers. So uh, the interested consumers 
pick up their orders through online, through uh, messenger uh, mes messaging or orders. So because of uh, this uh, system, uh, uh, we we still uh, uh, we still uh, we still uh, practice social distancing and able to prevent uh, uh, infection of uh, COVID. Okay, thank you, Jumer. Another question for Pakisama. Uh, this is from Sipia Sari Ginsang. She's asking, how do smallholder farmers sell their products for export purposes that have been successful in the Philippines so we can follow in Indonesia? <coughs> Anyone okay. from the panelists? Yes. Go ahead, okay, Juma. As, as local producer, uh, we are uh, we don't uh, export or produce. We uh, sell it to the local uh, consumers because of these uh, limitations. So we just uh, empowering the local market in uh, the way uh, in the way that uh, we can uh, still. Uh, we can still uh, uh, market our produce. That's it. So it's selling local, growing local yes, and selling yes. local. We do not okay. uh, export. Okay. Thank you, Jumer. Uh, this question now is for FAO and for Grow Asia. You can choose who to answer first. The question is, won't investments from the private sector only render, render farming communities at the mercy of suppliers companies and corporate entities. Anyone? Reggie? Michael, you can, do you have? Yeah, okay. yeah go ahead. It's, it's actually, it's a great question. I saw it go in the Q&A earlier. So whoever wrote this, thank you for that. Maybe there's two, two points to this I'd bring up. Um, one, and I'd be here curious to hear Croatia's comment on this particular issue as well, but it's interesting when you, when you say, would the private sector potentially have a harmful impact on farmers? Um, many of us consider farmers to be the private sector. I, I think Jumer is a, is a businessman. Um, he is a small businessman by definition, but, but he's in business. He's trying to make a living. So, so I, I think that the more important issue is what do we do to prevent the imbalances that happen when there are more powerful groups? In, in the food supply chain or food systems, um, no matter who those more powerful groups are. And, and some are mentioned here, so the potential for suppliers or uh, large corporations, I assume it means to probably buyers of product <coughs> uh, or, or maybe middlemen who are, are um, purchasing wholesale have power over farmers. And this is where we look to, to obvious guidance like the ASEAN principles for promoting responsible investment. So we believe that, that these groups, the suppliers, the companies that you're concerned about should be held to these guidance. Um, because if they're following those guidelines, they won't have farming communities at their mercy. They won't be doing damage to them. They won't be exerting undue influence on them. They'll be working with them in a way that is win-win, that provides mutual benefit. So this is the simple answer to that. There is guidance out there as to how these relationships should be organized. I, I, we could go on, but maybe um, in the sake of time, let's see if Reggie would like to add to this. Sure, and, and Michael, I like the reference to RAI. Um, and I think the only, um, to, to put, uh, to add a bit more to your comment on RAI, I think that's the nature of how we see, we want the private sector um, to, to embed a lot more of these responsible or, or safety nets as, as part of uh, that investment. So whether it's working on capacity building at the same time, or for example, as part of their investment, they help uh, the farmer organization achieve certification, for example, that becomes a win-win arrangement uh, for both parties. Um, and, and so another comment uh, not related to RAI, I guess is in terms of the nature of the private sector investment, some of the, um, you know, especially when you look at agritech, has definitely a, a, a disruptive type of potential of writing a little bit of that imbalance. Um, so when the, the farmer group has, say, 
ac easier access to finance, easier access to information, um, easier access to being able to sell their market, uh, their produce to all different types of alternative uh, markets through, let's say, digital e-commerce uh, platforms that can uh, go a step in also trying to address that imbalance. Thank you so much for both your inputs. We have a last question here for Sirka, Sir Glenn, Dr. Glenn. Yes. The question is, rice is a staple for the Southeast Asian countries. What are the effects of COVID-19 to our rice farmers? And how can we help our rice farmers during this pandemic? What investments can be made to help our rice farmers even beyond this pandemic? This is actually three questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. Um, it's a one webinar to discuss all these things. <laughs> but what 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 is important now is we will be having a food security problem because some of the countries in Southeast Asia are closing down, are closing their trade. That's why I mentioned that we have opened up the trade because one, some countries may be food insecure because like the Philippines, we are importing a lot of rice. But also a good thing in there is uh, we start buying local. But at the same time, if you look at our, 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 our production, it's low than our demand. So what I'm saying is uh, the, the government is now, before the pandemic, uh, we have already the... Uh, a rice competitive enhancement fund where they are we have a good chance to be competitive by 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 exploiting what the government is giving to to the farmers but what is important here is make the farmers organize let them organize themselves so that they will receive the machineries they will receive some uh, financial incentive once the farmers are not organized enough or they will not register themselves in the in the in the local uh, government units, then they will not be uh, having. So what I'm saying is farmers should be active. They should register themselves, keep them organized and incentives. There's a huge money out there to, to tap with. At the same time, as most of the people are saying, we have to be digitally uh, uh, skilled or else we will be out of business. So we have to be competitive. We have to make rice, uh, rice industry a business not only production side, but that's a short message for all. Okay, thank you. So by local, organize farmers to be competitive. We have uh, two questions here for all our panelists. Uh, one is from Josephat <coughs> Banuelos of Thailand. His question is, what are the challenges and opportunities for investments and, innovation and innovations in a new normal? So any of our panelists can answer this. Or you can all answer. Can you repeat the question again? Yes. Challenges. What are what are the challenges and opportunities for investments and innovations in a new normal? Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start. Maybe many will, uh, will add more. Uh, actually, this pandemic is uh, actually it's an eye opener. It's a big challenge, but it's a big opportunities also. That's make the innovation made it faster because people realize now the importance to be digital, digitally equipped. We have to be innovative. We have to be competitive, or else we'll be out of business. I think the opportunity, the opportunity there is to be really think like a businessman. So mm -hmm. we have to. To, to think it that way, this is the, the start that we have to organize ourselves, like what Jomar is doing, organize the youth, use the digital means. And there's a lot of uh, investment out there, as uh, mentioned by some of our, our, our panelists here, investment, how to tap them. So we have to, to be, if, if you're young and you, are, you, you have the opportunity to to go to the net, then there's another, it's just a matter of how to pick them. So it's don't wait for the, for those investment or to, for those money to come to you, but make a proposal, tap those uh, investors. And I think they have, you have a lot of uh, 
opportunities there because there's a lot of tax uh, grace um, period for tax if you do start up business as what we are doing at Circa we have an we have a, a, a new department we call it the emerging innovation for growth where we have the technology transfer open innovation and uh, incubation startup so we're helping startup uh, businesses in agricultural innovations to to make it happen so we're giving funds also like the grow asia so these are the best opportunities for for us an opportunity actually okay thank you and reggie michael would you like to add to that um let me go first um so i think the the impact of uh, the supply chain. Um, so I talked about the, the logistics aspect, the, the end consumer uh, changing in end consumer behavior, or even the, the this intermediation in the supply chain. And uh, in my earlier presentation, I think those are definitely um, things that the private sector will have to think about. It will necessitate, um, I think, changing in their business models, the way they they look at you know, working with uh, their suppliers, um, taking into account the health and safety of their workers as well. Um, but that also is the, the biggest opportunity um, in, 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 in so far as um, here's a chance to accelerate some of these these good practices and bring it to to the food and food and agriculture system. So so sorry, it's not it's not super defined because uh, I touched a little bit of all of it in, in a bit of my presentation earlier. Thank you, Michael. Anything to add? Sure, and I'm going to add as um, has been described. There are a lot of opportunities, and it really is up to to particularly young people, but everybody out there to define them. But a big challenge that exists is maybe for those of us who are a bit more senior, um, a bit older, um, working not necessarily on the farm, but, but with governments and policy to ensure that we change the environment in which innovators and young people are working in so that they can get the support that they need. Um, so Dr. Glenn mentioned an incubation center at Circa. This is excellent. We need more of these incubation centers to bring up young people in the agricultural sector not just business innovation in general, but, but agricultural innovation, to look at add-on services that can add value to products, um, to look at supplement information services, um, what type of digital information can be supplied to rural farmers to help them do better, to connect them to markets, to give cooperatives, as we saw the AFA video at the beginning, um, how can the cooperative that's trying to go direct consumer now get some a small amount of funding that they need to ensure that their business becomes a sustainable business? We need to make those changes. We need to look at the incentives and policies that we have in place that tend to favor older people and bigger businesses. Um, and we need to ensure that we're not inhibiting this innovation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in. And uh, this question from Facebook, the question is, how do we capacitate, prepare youth, young farmers, young family farmers to take part in social accountability in these trying times? Maybe we can hear from our young farmer, Jumer. This message, this message I already posted it in my social media. Uh, as a young farmer, and also a uh, young agripreneur, my perspective is any problem is an opportunity. This is the right time to renew our agricultural sector and to raise the voice of youth in agriculture. It is also the opportunity to put shifting of white collar jobs into food producing works and engagement to rural livelihood through investing in young people. Support local cooperatives that pushing the agenda of enticing the rural youth to pursue career in agriculture. Support youth in agriculture as major nation builder. This is based in our Republic Act 8044 in Philippines. And also as organic advocate, organic agriculture is the alternative to revitalize our agriculture. We must feed the soil to feed our stomach. Let's go organic and do organic. It is based on RA 168. That's it, Mabuay. 
Okay, uh, Jumar, this is also for you. It says okay. here, how do you encourage youth to engage in agriculture? And what steps have you done in order for this youth to follow the path you're heading? How can you encourage more youth to become like you? Yes. I'd start advocating uh, go organic, go agriculture. I am posting it in social media. Make your uh, ideas as your passion. If you think uh, creatively, I think it can, uh, it can make difference to uh, your uh, followers. Be because of my uh, uh, passion in agriculture, uh, my followers uh, becomes 5,000 uh, people. So uh, it really, uh, and it helps me in organizing the uh, Young Farmers Cooperative uh, uh, group in our cooperative. Uh, we do have uh, three uh, clusters in, uh, in, three uh, in three respective uh, towns, uh, Pamplona, Ligmanan, and Pasakaw, the uh, second district of uh, Camarinesur, uh, Bicol region. So because of uh, using this uh, social media platform, I can, uh, I can easily uh, transmit my, my advocacies, mm -hmm. my, my activities, so they can engage I link them in the by by sharing the post of Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Training Institute, and other activities of NGOs. So the youth can uh, uh, easily link them to uh, more opportunities and other uh, uh, trans uh, and other uh, changing of mindset. So this this is it. So yeah, really, it's... yes, yeah. yes, Dr. Yeah. Glenn. Yeah, I just add a little bit like we have now uh, at Circa, we're doing the Youth for Agriculture. So four A's in agriculture. I think I like Jomar what he's saying, have the passion doing it, but we start to categorize a different aspect of youth from the beginner up to the uh, 21 and uh, above youth, which we want an initial part. We have to make them aware. We have the four A's, awareness, only just to give them awareness because they just don't know what agriculture is. Then after that, if they have the awareness, they have the uh, appreciation. Then we have the application. Then we have the action. So that's how we approach them. So don't bombard them first with uh, the very big things, but let them be, we have the four A's of, of doing things. So we have to start uh, who are the, for the awareness stage, who are the appreciation stage, application stage, and the action stage. So. I could talk a lot of this one, but I'll just share that four A's in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glenn. Okay, and Jumar, thank you so much. Uh, the last question we have here from Rabin Rai from Nepal. And I think this is for FAO. The question is, what are FAO's plans to support marketing of, agri of agricultural products? Uh, let me repeat the question. What are FAO's plans to support marketing of agricultural products? So I guess from FAO, I have to answer that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, kidding. Yeah, sure. Good question. Yeah. Uh, as, as one of the things I mentioned in, in, in my presentation, actually, uh, a really important area for investment is to, and for responsible investment, is to actually help link farmers to markets. So this is a major way we can actually increase the the, the livelihoods of farmers, their ability to, to access markets. And FAO is looking at this in, in many countries in, in the region. Um, and I'll highlight, if I may, for the moment, some work that I'm directly involved in, uh, which is our cooperation with Asia Dra. Um, and through Asia Draw, working with the National Draw to, to look at issues related to youth and responsible investment and how both in, um, governments can improve their policies to invest in youth, but how young people can get more actively engaged in the processes around creating these policies and creating government incentives for the agricultural sector. Because I think this is really a critical area of, of work that, that young people actually 
get a platform to, to not only build their businesses, but to engage in the environment around them that's going to make their business easier, to make it easier for them to market their products, to determine what the market wants, um, to get financing for their products, to seek export if they're interested, to learn about the standards that would be required for that. So really, this is an area that we're very focused on at the moment, but there are also many more interventions by FAO in the region um, to support the marketing of agricultural products in different countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. We have so many questions still coming in. We'd like to apologize to all those who sent in their questions and weren't asked um, due to the limitation of time. But if we can, uh, we have a copy of your questions and we'll see how, if it's possible to get responses from that at a later point. So thank you again, panelists. Thank you so much for all your insights and your response to the questions. While we were having the discussion, we have a colleague who's doing graphic recording of our webinar. May I call on Mr. Kiko Miranda to briefly present to us the recap of the discussions. Just to give a brief background of um, what graphic recording is, graphic recording is um, the real-time translation of conversations or presentations into text and pictures. It gives meetings such as like webinars like this one, and it gives our um, attendees an opportunity to absorb content on a visual level. As graphic recorders, we do three things simultaneously. We, lis we listen for key ideas. We synthesize them and document them in visual form. And I am presenting to you um, the key highlights that I um, got from the discussion, a very interesting and very inspiring um, discussion. And I will start with our keynote, our keynote by Ms. Esther Penubia, Secretary General of AFA. Um, Ms. Esther highlighted um, the impacts of COVID-19 to family farmers. She mentioned that because of the pandemic, there were no markets. There were no buyers and there were no processing and storage facilities, thus disrupting the supply chain. And this led to the loss of income of family farmers. She then presented to us some stories on the ground, stories of family farmers from across, across the ASEAN region and their initiatives. She mentioned about the initiatives from Myanmar who distributed food packs and, and organized farmer direct selling. She also mentioned um, the production of face masks in India. In Laos, there was private, public private partnerships to bring produce to market. And in Nepal, they, they, they initiated a kitchen, kitchen gardens. One of the organizations which she highlighted was the organization of indigenous women farmers in Kagat. In Kagat, um, she highlighted the initiatives and the opportunities that Kagat women farmers um, that, that Kagat um, explored and ventured um, to address the effects of the pandemic. In their weekend um, farmers market, um, they organized a weekend farmers market partnering with um, the local barangay and used the basketball court to turn it into a weekend farmers market. And um, with the support of the De La Salle brothers, you know, they, the De La Salle brothers ordered 600 food packs um, of um, favorite Filipino um, um, health nutritious dishes like pinakpet, sinigang, and laing. Kagat Old was able also to distribute 100 food packs to their to most vulnerable families and have partnered with two online vegetable de delivery shops. And this resulted to the, the results of this initiative by Kagat have, have, um, have resulted to 100 members um, helped by their initiative an increase of 25% in the average price of products, and the decrease of at least 5% in the retail price of products sold to consumers. Their capital also increased from around $250, it has increased to $1,600 in a span of four weeks. And their net income for just one month of, opera of operation was um, $1,340. Furthermore, the Kagat women, the, the Kagat organization uh, expressed that um, they were able to contribute to the supply of more nutritious food packs to urban poor families. The, their initiative also, um, in partnership also with um, Pakisama, no? with the help of Pakisama, they were able to expand their contacts and broaden their partners. 
and this has increased solidarity among members and its consumers. Ms. Esther ended with a call to action. Sorry. Her, oops. Her call to action was um, for direct financing to FFPOs, specifically in the areas of communication and COVID-19, emergency assistance, climate resilient agri-ecosystem in F3, knowledge management, policy engagement, and the value addition and shorter food chain. And everything, and, and all of this, um, the approach is the multi-stakeholder partnership approach, wherein they, they will, the, the goal you know, is to be able for, our, for the women, men, young farmers, um, will be able to organize themselves, will be able to, be, um, to have access to um, education and capacity building, in capacity building activities you know, um, through their farmer organizations and co-ops. I will then proceed to the key highlights of our four very inspiring speakers. I have divided it into three areas, impacts, innovations, and investments. For the impacts, from, a, from the very our very inspiring young farmer, Jumer Marcadia of um, AFA and Pakisama, he mentioned that the locally in the Philippines, in, in, in the experience, in, the, in our local experience, um, these are the impacts of the COVID-19 to our young, to our family farmers and young farmers. Um, the limitation of mobility has affected um, the, their sector, specifically the age restrictions of, of, the, of, quarant of quarantine and also the limited mode of transport. They also had difficulty in accessing education, educational opportunities due to um, those, uh, most of the education, um, educational um, opportunities have transitioned online and um, some have not, not, no access to internet. Um, the difficulty of organizing and mobilizing because, yes, of limit, limited net connections. Um, farmers also had difficulty accessing government programs and also um, the, the challenge of marketing and processing um, produce such as delivery, um, processing, difficulty in processing areas and difficulty in processing equipment. Dr. Glenn Gregorio, the director of CIRCA, also highlighted some um, impacts of COVID-19 in, 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 in Southeast Asia. He mentioned that um, there, was, there was a reduced volume of production by around 17.3 million tons, which affected more than 100 million um, people in Southeast Asia. Um, there's also a, there, there was also a decline in the gross domestic product, no, amounting to around $3.76 billion. And that's very, very huge loss. Um, there's also a change in um, consumer preferences, increase in food prices due to unpredictable market, and the movement restrictions on transportation. This impact has also been um, um, shared, shared with by um, our other um, speakers. Dr. Glenn Gregorio suggested that um, there should be a change of mindset and systems. No? In innovations, um, I, I would like to start with the innovations um, done by um, Joomer and other initiatives. Uh, uh, they organized Young Farmers Cooperative Farm, um, innovations in, in, in local food markets, the use of social media for online marketing of products. No? Um, there's also um, 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 a sharing no, of how um, the public-private partnership should be strengthened. Participation in online discussions, sharing of the blessings. No, um, not only um, the, those that are given to them. They they have this culture of you know sharing also the blessings to their community, and the importance of organizing youth groups to push for the agenda of young farmers. Dr. Gregorio also um, um, presented to us um, the, a framework. A framework. A framework on, 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 on the need to um, change the mindset and creating new systems that are more inclusive. No? Um, he um, attain or the accelerating transformation through agriculture innovation. Um, I got these four key highlights from, um, from, from that framework. No? Um, how are we going to do it? Um, Dr. Gregorio suggested uh, to embrace destructive ag tech, um, build transformational leadership, to empower our next generation agri graduates and to build divides and promote harmony. On the area of investment, Dr. Uh, Michael Reeks from FAO um, 
talked about responsible investments. And he mentioned that responsible investments in agriculture is one of the most effective strategies for reducing hunger and poverty and generating economic growth. He further, um, he further suggested that and highlighted in his um, presentation no, um, on if you want to build back better, we would want to focus on these key areas by shortening supply chain, ensuring worker safety, um, technology, the use of technology and um, capitalizing on technology, creating new financial products, financial products that are youth specific, farmer specific, or even blended products, and um, to create the right incentives for, for farmers. And lastly, Reginald Leaf, Director of Grow Asia, Director of Partnerships for Grow Asia, um, mentioned the four areas of innovative partnerships, and he presented um, some short-term some short-term ideas and some long-term ideas um, in the four areas of innovative partnership. The first area was rural rural, log rural logistics. Um, for the short term, um, the use of green lanes and the harmonization of rules and movements of goods you know, can, be, um, can be explored or is being explored already. But for the long term, we might want to um, um, explore the use of digital solutions to address rural, rural logistics. Um, for cash flow, for the short term, you know, there, um, the government, government, or government agencies, individuals, donors um, provide um, inputs for the, uh, to the farmers for the next crop cycle. But in the long term, um, we, might, we might want also he suggested you know, to, to, for us to, to capitalize on e-wallet or mobile money. For new marketing channels in the short term, um, we have, he mentioned the identification and redistribution of alternative to alternative markets. And for the long term, how could we um, foster direct selling, uh, foster an environment where direct selling to agribusiness consumers from farmer to agribusiness consumer will be possible. And lastly, in the area of far farmer communication, in the short term, our com the communication channels um, that are wide widely used to reach farmers are radio, internet, TV. But um, for the long term, we might um, need to focus on um, the use of digital technologies um, for like chat and also um, tap influencers. Maybe Joomer can be one of our influencers so who would influence more you know, youth to um, venture into, um, into agriculture and also live streaming of, of events and other activities. And that is uh, my uh, my the recording of the entire proceedings and I hope um, I was able to get the key highlights of this conversation for today. Thank you very much. Muchisimas gracias from Zamboanga City. Thank you so much Kiko for giving us a very visual summary, visual and creative summary of the discussions for the whole uh, webinar. Uh, for our participants, this the graphic recording of the webinar will be available soon on Asia Dra Facebook and website. So to formally close our webinar, may I request, may I call on Marlene Ramirez, the Secretary General of Asia Dra, to close us. Marlene? Coming from various sectors, of course, from the farmers organization represented by Esther Penunia, Secretary General of AFA. And Jumer, our very dynamic young farmer. Thank you, Jumer, for sharing to us your, your energy uh, representing Pakisama. Of course, Dr. Glenn Gregorio from the Academia from Sayarka and Michael, hello, Michael, from FAO. And uh, of course, Reggie Lee from Grow Asia, where Asia Dra and uh, AFA also sit in the civil society um, committee. So likewise, thank you to the many and uh, substantive questions from the virtual floors. We take note of the participation of about 130 in the Zoom platform and more than, and more participants joining through the Facebook streaming. We have heard from our very good speakers, not only how the pandemic has uh, negatively impacted on agriculture, especially the smallholders, family farmers, and food producers, but also on the areas for action. Uh, and 
as Michael earlier said, many of these are actually not new polls. Many of these have been uh, have been uh, core content of uh, advocacies of civil society organizations and have been uh, implemented on the ground. But the pandemic, and this is what we say, maybe the silver lining of this pandemic is that it has dramatized the need for us to pay more attention. Uh, and when I say us, it means that we, we talk about this multi-stakeholder uh, platforms or partnerships. And uh, thanks to the very comprehensive uh, summing up, so I don't have to uh, mention well I, what I thought were key points, no? but uh, we have heard uh, about it on uh, the importance of strengthening farmers' organization, especially uh, young uh, farmers uh, in so that uh, we are able to respond to the sustainability of our future the, and uh, our food security. Um, so I think for Asia Dra, we would like to take this as an opportunity to um, thank uh, AFA and FAO for co-organizing this webinar or alert to uh, both organizations. We work closely in pushing for the implementation of the national action plans in relation to the UN decade for family farming beginning 2019 to 2028. We believe that the UNDFF already provide us with a, a very comprehensive a framework for partnership and um, an opportunity where we could converge our actions at the national and regional levels. Likewise, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Michael, we also thank FAO that we are able to translate the committee for uh, World Committee for Food Security, RAI instrument, the Responsible Agriculture uh, investment instrument into very concrete cooperation in the ASEAN region and with particular focus on youth, investment for and by youth. And of course, to grow Asia for the cooperation with ASEAN that no one's try into AGRI, the ASEAN Guidelines for Responsible Agriculture Investment, which we are now uh, building capacity on at the national level, if only to ensure that investments that are much needed are uh, responsible, uh, responsive, and are sustainable. So we hope that we can interact with some of you, uh, both at uh, the region and at the national levels in the coming periods. We also hope that this webinar contributed to your understanding on how various sectors are working in their own ways, some uh, converging to contribute in developing more sustainable agriculture and food systems, towards building resilient families and communities uh, in the now and in the coming years. So um, I think back to you, Arlene, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, again, co-organize this event with partner organizations. Thank you, Marlene. So on behalf of Asia Dra, AFA, Pakisama, and the UN FAO, we would like to thank our panelists Jumer, Dr. Glenn, Michael, and Reggie. Thank you. We would also like to thank our donor partner, EU and FAO, and all of you participants who joined us today. So we'd like to ask you to join us again in the next round of e-conversations on new rural development. Watch out for the details. Please do not forget to like our Facebook page or add our Facebook account to know more about stories of rural peoples and their communities in Asia. As you leave the Zoom meeting room, you will be redirected to an online evaluation survey. We hope you could provide us feedback on the webinar and uh, we will also provide an e-certificate once you've completed the feedback survey. So this is Arlene Contreras from Asia Dra, thanking you and hope to see you in the next alert episode. Good day, everyone.